typical measurements in a medical setting indicative of good health, like you know sugar, your your cholesterol, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. We did growth hormone resting, and then they went and did sprinate every how many they could do starting. And that's usually about two to three for most people just starting out. Then immediately, within thirty minutes, come back to the hospital would pull their blood to make sure that they're releasing growth hormone. Average case. Uh, growth hormone was released uh, 498%, and that's for middle-aged adults. The research cited in the book, the, most of the studies there were done on young college-age students that happened to be in a, at a medical university. But this study shows, and it's about ready to be published, uh, that for middle-aged women, mostly women, the, uh, the increase of growth hormone was huge. What's really interesting, the average body fat loss was 28%. Wow. During that time. Wow. 28%. There were only nine pounds, nine to right at just a little bit under 10 pounds on average lost. However, for many of the women, it, and, I, and our hospital is in Mississippi. We're in the fattest state in America. And West Virginia knocked us off for a couple of months this past year, but we <laughs> earned it right back. We're still the fattest state in America. And so, and, and our nurse employees are pretty, uh, uh, pretty big, big, you know, examples of that to some degree, uh, of middle aged nurses. And uh, we've had almost remarkable people look like they've lost whole human beings in size, but they've really not lost, uh, uh, you know, all that much weight because they've put on muscle, but body fat has dropped substantially. And the big surprise in the study, though, when you would probably get some results like that, uh, that, that was a little bit more, 28% in eight weeks, which is really pretty phenomenal. But we also learned that for likely statin users for cholesterol issues, that uh, the spinate actually mimics the results of statin drugs. Wow. So we're talking about a $14 billion industry, the number one drug uh, industry, uh, number one selling drug in America is a statin drug to clo- control cholesterol. And uh, we had... Uh, drops anywhere between 31. One of the test subjects had a 63-point drop. Another one had a 50-point drop. Most had 30-point drops in cholesterol. We had one of the uh, uh, test subjects who uh, is one of our leading nurses here. Um, very lean, looks like a model. Uh, we didn't think she really needed to lose weight, but she wanted to be in the study, so she volunteered and she jumped in. But her body fat went from 31% to 18%, but her cholesterol went from 273 to 190 in eight weeks, and this is without any dieting. We tell them, don't diet. The only variable should be sprint eight three times a week. Do whatever you're doing. So we're, we're in a hospital in the fattest state in America. We got a 28% body fat reduction without diet. Now, what would happen if we had dieting to it? It has to be better, but we'd like to get a grant and, and, and study that in the future. But what's interesting is that same group now that did the eight-week study, they're coming up on their six-month study. And what and what we're seeing, and we don't have the data, they're just starting to do the test right now, but the growth hormone release stayed the same or greater than, than uh, 500%. Our chief nurse executive went through it. Uh, her, her growth hormone release was 988%. And so that actually mimics taking growth hormone injections. And what we see, the results actually mimic. You can go and get take growth hormone injections and get pretty good results, but there obviously there's side effects when you inject something that costs $1,000 a month that does that artificially, but when you do it naturally the way the body was made to do it, which is scientific play, 20 minutes, three times a week, of which 12 minutes a week is hard exercise without dieting, we had a 28% body fat loss for the first eight weeks, but several of those now are up to 50-pound body fat loss. Uh, my administrative assistant uh, actually went through the program. She's coming up on six months. Uh, she uh, has lost a little bit over 50 pounds, and her body fat went from 44% to 26%. Now, she has still some room to go, and she'll tell you that, but the results are almost unbelievable that in six months' time, without dieting, this is what's happened. This is really a kind of revolution in the area of fitness and fat loss and wellness because most of us are not paying attention to these kind of details. It flies in the face of everything we've been told. Don't you agree? Oh, I, I, I do. When I... You know, Vision Fitness has my Sprint 8 cardio program and, and all their equipment. And when I first went up there, that one of their, their leaders called and said, hey, we're Vision Fitness. We need to be visionary. Let's see what this guy's saying. Because they were all long, slow marathoners, basically, and long, slow cyclists. And I was supposed to be there for an hour. They kept me for four hours and said, this guy's doing a study after study. But, you know, everybody's telling us long, slow. But, man, what he's saying makes sense. 
And so they tested the program themselves. The president's wife, I think, lost 30 pounds in eight weeks. And they tested for eight weeks. Callback said, man, there's something to this. Uh, and in those days, I had a few studies to point to the fact that we should be looking at how the body's telling us to exercise, not just creating and guessing. But we've learned so much more about the body and how muscles work. And that's sort of thing about the three energy systems. I mean, just think about it. For 20 years, we taught that lactic acid made you sore. You couldn't pass a test unless you said lactic acid sore. And even today, I have some exercise physiologists who graduated, you know, 20 years ago. They'll look at me like, what did you say? Lactic acid? What? What? And then I have to get the studies and show them. And, and the studies are there. I mean, lactic acid has nothing to do with soreness. Uh, it's reprocessing the body. And actually, it's your friend because you have to reach that level where lactic acid significantly elevating your body for a short period of time in order to release growth hormone. This is truly new knowledge. Now, you say in the book that it's very important not to eat fat before you exercise and not to eat sugar afterward. But a lot of things convert to sugar. So what do you mean by don't eat sugar afterwards? That is a controversial question, and, and, and here, here's why. If I'm working with an athlete, uh, uh, first of all, let me hit the fat piece real quick. What the studies say, if you eat a heavy, high-fat meal, which would be equal to like two Big Macs and two Biggie Fries, that's the kind of fat we're talking about that will blunt the release of growth hormone if you, if you go eat something like that before uh, you do Sprint 8. And then I always get asked, well, what about one Big Mac? And the answer is, we don't know. What about butter on a piece of toast? Well, that's for most people, that's probably not going to impact it. But what we know is this huge, this real super, super heavy high-fat meal, but we don't really have research. I cannot back up any, anything less than that because we don't have studies because exercise does not have a drug rep. You know, exercise, uh, I mean, it's hard to get research funds for that. If you got a drug, it's easy, easy to uh, get research funds. But it's hard for exercise to do that. A lot of exercise, uh, guys in research settings have to struggle to get just basic information. So we would love to test that here at King Stars Medical Center to find out what is the lower limit because we really don't know. We just know that if it's tons loaded with fat, that causes a, a, a blunting of you still release growth hormone. Just the amount of release is blunted because of that. Now, on the sugar afterwards issue, what what – we know is, uh, well, first of all, if I work with young athletes, we know that studies by, by John, Dr. John Ivey, who's a great researcher at the University of Texas, on young cyclists who are trying to recover. Recovery is their main goal because they're trying to recover so they can go compete four or five days in a row. Uh, the best way to recover, the quickest way to recover, is to get a four-to-one ratio of carbohydrates to protein within 30 minutes of exercise. Recovery does start quicker when you do that. However, recovery, when you think about the fast fiber, working fast fat, fast switch fiber and letting it heal, that's a that's a 48 hour process. So you have to kind of balance what your goals are. If your goals are quick recovery, then you want the four to one ratio, four carbs to one gram of protein. Okay. And that that's kind of that's the current model, and and that, there's really some mainstream research to show that's the best way to jumpstart recovery. However. If you're middle aged and maximizing growth hormone for a two hour synergy window, where they show in numerous studies, University of Virginia Medical Center and several other places, that once exercise induced growth hormone is released, it stays in your body for going, going after a body fat for two full hours uh, after exercise, just like you're doing cardio for two hours, except even more intense than that. That's what, that's what that hormone will do for your body if you, if you keep it circulating. But what they know is, if you spike insulin for whatever reason, some type of pr pr protection mechanism that they, we don't really totally understand yet, but if you spike insulin, it releases a hormone called somatostatin that, for whatever reason, shuts down growth hormone during that two-hour synergy window. Let's talk about your recommendation. What do you eat before you do this, or do you eat anything before this? Well, I always like a little carbohydrates before to help fuel the intensity uh, of the of the sprint egg. Afterwards, it just depends on if somebody's diabetic, pre-diabetic, or where they, where they fall on the metabolic syndrome uh, uh, scale. What happens is uh, the research shows that you know, diabetics do not produce uh, or, they, or their, their body does not uh, uh, 
digest glucose correctly. They become basically a fat-making machine because they have so much insulin resistance. Uh, if somebody's mean and lean,